Good afternoon, everybody. And today's topic that we're going to be discussing is the Phillips defibrillator. And we're going to go over how you set up and do the external pacing, the defibrillation, and synchronized cardioversion. Okay, so what is transcontaneous pacing, or TCP? It's electrical pacing of the heart through the skin. It's beneficial in symptomatic bradycardia, sinus bradycardia, high degree heart block, second degree type 2 block, third degree or complete block, atrial fibrillation with slow ventricular response, or any other bradycardic rhythm that causes symptoms. All right, so we know that we can set this up and we can actually do some pacing on somebody that has symptomatic bradycardia because the patient's symptoms are related to poor perfusion in the vital organs. Not just looking at heart rate, you look at level of consciousness, you look at blood pressure, cap refill, other things, but we know that they have bad perfusion. So you set it up and you go ahead and you turn it on, you start pacing. Now, how are they evaluated? Well, they're evaluated on their response to the level of perfusion not just looking at the heart rate alone. So you're gonna to look to see if the level of consciousness gets better. Is his blood pressure improved? Do things look like they're getting better? Now an example of when you will never or you should not use it is you have well-conditioned athletes who have great perfusion when their heart rate usually runs like in the low 40s that are bradycardia all the time. Okay, let's discuss setting up for transcutaneous pacing. So you wanna remove the electrodes that are on the crash cart. We'll show them to you here in a few minutes, and I'll show you some slides that'll show you what they look like and how to place them. And there is more than one way. Now, before we start talking about pad placement, you have to ensure that you have the leads placed on the patient. This is true when you're using pacing of any kind. Otherwise, it's only good, just the pad placement's good for defibrillation and cardioversion, but not for pacing. So for pacing, you have to have the lead wires on and you have to have the pads on both. So when in regard to pad placement, you have the anterior chest where you can place in the apical area, that's the negative, and the posterior pad you can place in the mid upper back area, which is a positive. So they're placed between the spine and the scapula. You don't want to put them over a bone because it's a poor conductor of electricity. So you want to avoid that, but the easier way is for me to show you actual pictures of the electrodes and then how to place them and there's more than one way to place them and i'll show them to you right now okay so let's take a look at what's on the crash cart you're going to find a package which looks like the one over here on the left these are used for transcontaneous pacing defibrillation and synchronized cardioversion and the picture on the right is showing you pad placement we'll talk about that more in a second but i also want you to know also on the crash cart are these these are defibrillator pads. Now these take the place of using gel like we used to use a while back when you put them on the paddles and then you went ahead and defibrillated or shocked the patient. So instead of that, we put these pads on now and then the paddles go on top of these. And you'll see they've shown you the chest placement in these also, but this is what the difference is between the two. When you're looking at this and you have the pads placed correctly, you're gonna see when it's charged, how the current flows through the skin across the heart to the other pad and by phasic it'll travel from one pad to the other and it goes like in a loop and comes back just like you see on the picture on the left it travels like in a circuit then hopefully it's shocking the heart and bringing it back into a nice sinus rhythm again and that's how it shocks the heart it does it in this circuit fashion now there is one other method and that's to place them both anterior and posterior and you'll see that's in this picture here. So it's the second method of being able to place your pads. Okay, let's talk about the settings now. So what you wanna do first is you wanna set that rate to 80. Okay, so go ahead and turn the machine on and set it to pacer like in the picture. The next thing you wanna do is you wanna set the pacer rate. So you're gonna hit the button that says pacer rate. You're gonna use the up and down arrows of those little triangles next to the check mark and you're gonna set that pacer rate. In this case, it's 80. Then you're going to hit the check mark and that locks it in. Then you're going to come back and you're going to do number two, the pacer output, which is the milliamps. You're going to use the same up and down arrow keys. So you're going to set the milliamps and then you're going to hit the check mark and that's going to lock that one in also. Now, after you've done all of those things, I mean, take a look in the picture and you'll see a button where it says start pacing. 
it's in demand mode right now so it will start pacing at that rate continuously no matter what like we discussed so just hit start pacing and that's all you have to do and then you want to decide on the sensitivity uh, it's auto or it's demand now if it's demand and you have it set at 80 the pacemaker is going to fire 80 times a minute no matter what it's always going to fire 80 but let's say you have a patient that is going from you know a sinus rhythm let's say he's in the 70s 80s but he drifts down into the brady down to 30s and then he comes back up and he's kind of wandering like that you can use the auto part of this and let's say you set it at 60 well anytime he drops below that 60 the pacer will fire and it will always keep him at 60 or better depending on his intrinsic rate so you know, most of the time you're going to put this on demand Okay, let's say you want to set it from demand mode over into auto. So what you're going to do is come over here to your main menu by hitting the check mark. It'll bring it up. And the first one, uh, it's not real clear, but what it says, it says pacer mode. So you want to make sure that with your up and down arrows that you're on pacer mode. Then go ahead and hit the check mark key again. Okay, so here's a photo showing you after you've hit the check mark and it says pacer mode. Now you can go between demand and fixed. You put it down into demand and hit the check mark again. And now you're in that auto mode where the patient rate was to fall below a certain set level. It will kick in and keep them at that rate. The output, well, that's the milliamps. You're going to start at zero and then you're going to start to turn it up and you're going to keep turning it until you get capture like you show here in the picture on the lowest energy level settings. Okay, so capture is when you get this wide QRS complex following a pace for spike like you see in the picture. Once you have capture, then evaluate your patient. And let's see about his perfusion status. Now, you're not going to just look at the rate, okay? You want to look at his level of consciousness, what the blood pressure is, what does his color look like? You could even look at cap refill. You want to look at other things. I mean, most people will focus in on just the heart rate. So learn to focus in on other things going on with the patient. Okay, let's talk about pain management now for transcutaneous pacing. Transcutaneous pacing is painful and comfortable for the patient. So they're going to give you orders for light sedation. So in this case, let's just say they're administering Valium as a benzodiazepine to relax the patient. It's given two milligrams IV push, usually over two minutes. You can repeat every two minutes as needed to a max of 10 milligrams. Now you gotta think about pain management. Well, you can use fentanyl, which is an opiate, at one mic per kilogram IV push, and you can repeat this dose every five minutes up to 200 micrograms total dose. Watch for respiratory depression in both categories of meds because you don't want them to stop breathing. So. You want to keep an eye on those things. Now, I've seen them use other medications besides just Valium and fentanyl. They could have used Versed. They could have used morphine. It's really driven by the physician and the physician orders. Okay, let's talk about synchronized cardioversion. It's a controlled form of defibrillation with delivery of lower energy settings. It's used when a patient still has an organized rhythm and a pulse. The electrical discharge is delivered during the R-wave of the QRS complex. Okay, so now let's talk about synchronized cardioversion indicators. It's for unstable supraventricular tachycardia, unstable rapid A-flutter or A-fib, narrow complex tachycardia. It could be unstable ventricular tachycardia or wide complex tachycardia. Now for completion's sake, I know we deal with adult patients, but we throw up the part about PEDS, probable SVT with poor perfusion after no response to meds. PEDS is possible VT with poor perfusion, or SVT, VT with adequate perfusion and still no response to medication. So these are your indicators for synchronized cardioversion. Now there's a side note, if the current was to be delivered on the downslope of a T wave, which is the relative refractory period, it can cause the rhythm to flip into V-fib. Okay, so let's talk about stable versus unstable tachycardia. In tachycardia, the ventricles contract so fast that they're unable to properly fill the capacity. 
So if they don't fill the capacity, then when they contract, you have smaller stroke volume than what's normal, and you're not pushing out as much blood as you normally would. This leads to an overall decrease in cardiac output. So for stability, what you want to check is check their level of consciousness. This is the first indicator to change. And blood pressure is the last indicator to change. Okay, we're still talking about synchronized cardioversion, but now we're going to talk about the sedation part of it. The conscious patient should be sedated if all possible. It's a very painful procedure. But don't delay the procedure just to sedate. Sedation is usually with a benzodiazepine. Versed's a good example, 2 mg IV push every 2 minutes, with a max dose of 10 mg total dose. For pain control, fentanyl, 1 microgram per kilogram, repeated every 5 minutes for a max dose of 200 micrograms. Point being, you want to make sure that you give something for pain and you give something for sedation. We talked about this earlier in the example where they used, you know, Valium, but like I said, it's up to the physician and they could choose to use Versed, which is usually the case in synchronized cardioversions. Okay, let's talk about the setup for synchronized cardioversion. You're going to activate the synchronizer mode button. Okay, we're going to assume that we have a patient and they're tachycardic at 168 and we need to do this cardioversion. So you're going to turn the machine on, we're going to set it up to 50 joules, and then you're going to turn around and you're going to press the sync button. What you should get are these little white dots coming across the screen to show that it's syncing on the R wave. And then you should have a little green box that shows sync right down by his finger. If you don't have these white dots and you don't have that green symbol showing sync, don't try to charge and discharge the shock because you could end up flipping them into V-fib or some other bad arrhythmia. So you want the white dots there, you want the box that shows sync. If you don't, check your plugs, check all your connections, and then hit that sync button again. The machine will then try to resync onto those R waves. When you have this the correct way, then you can go ahead and you can hit the charge button. You tell everybody to clear and make sure there's no oxygen source around if possible. Then you can go ahead and hit the shock button. There's going to be a momentary delay and then it'll discharge. After that, assess the monitor and assess your patient. And let me show you a picture of what I mean by the flagging and when it discharges. Okay, now here's a picture showing you the flagging on those R waves, and then you'll see where the machine discharged, and boom, it bounces them back into this sinus rhythm over here on the far right. Okay, let's talk about precautions with cardioversion. Well, one of the precautions is if you have a patient that's in atrial fibrillation more than 48 hours and they're not on any anticoagulants, they have an increased risk of blood clot formation in that quivering atria. So it's sitting there quivering and we come along and we shock it by doing a cardioversion. It can cause the atria to contract and then could break off a clot and increase the risk for a stroke or cause a stroke. So we want to avoid cardioversion, if all possible, on atrial fibrillation patient until they have a detailed and further evaluation done. So in the bottom right, I show you another example of where you have atrial fibrillation. You can see where the shocks are delivered, and we brought them back to another normal sinus rhythm. Okay, let's talk about defibrillation now. And what is it? Well, it's a non-synchronized delivery of energy during any part of the cardiac cycle. So what we're hoping to achieve by delivering this large electrical shock is that the cells of the heart depolarize, and that will allow them to repolarize uniformly or correctly, and we hope to bring them out of the arrhythmia that they're in. Electrical therapy causes the heart to conduct simultaneously, so the electrical shock is making the whole heart contract. So the overall goal of the shock is to allow the SA node to reset itself, which is the dominant pacemaker of the heart, and to take back over electrical control of the heart and start beating correctly again. That's what we're hoping for. Okay, let's talk about setting up for defibrillation. You can perform CPR while setting up the machine and getting your pads placed on the patient. You can hold CPR for a brief moment while you analyze the rhythm. You can confirm whether they're in V-fib or V-tac. Charge a unit is recommended by the manufacturer. Now, generally, we're going to charge to 150 on the first go around. 
and you can continue CPR until the unit's charged. Hit the charge button, the machine will let you know when the charge is ready and then make sure everybody's clear, nobody's touching the patient or the bed. Then you can hit the shock button and then that's your defibrillation. And make sure there's no oxygen source or try to keep the oxygen away from the patient. So now let's go through it one more time by showing you pictures and slides. Okay, here's an actual monitor and you're gonna take that dial and you're gonna dial it up to 150. That's gonna be the usual starting point for defibrillation and you're gonna hit the charge button. Now this is assuming you have the pads on the patient, everything's hooked up. People were doing CPR, you're gonna tell them to hold CPR, stand clear of the patient. When the unit's charged, it's gonna beep and you're gonna hit that shock button and that will deliver the shock to the patient. Then you can assess them quickly and decide whether or not you need to resume CPR or what your next step is gonna be. And here's an example where the shock was delivered. So let's take a look from the far left. He has a sinus beat, he goes into a VTAC, he's shocked, he goes into a coarse V-fib, fine V-fib, back to coarse V-fib, back to a coarse V-fib uh, still towards the right, and then an electrical shock again, and then he comes back into a sinus rhythm. Okay, I want to thank everybody. This is going to conclude our discussion on transcontaneous pacing, defibrillation, and synchronized cardioversion. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.